when I like hear your name, the first thing that comes to mind is like back in June, July, August, where it's like I sit down at night and all of a sudden you get like the Zeneca spreadsheets mm. and it would just break down the floor prices and then it'd be your commentary. And that almost became like a daily ritual. I miss those days. I literally believe that is what made everything blow up. There were none of these floor price tracking websites. OpenSea yeah. did not have the floor price. If you want to, like, this was it. And everyone would just share it and like retweet. And, and I just did it every single day for about six months. And entire space was blowing up as well. When I got in in February, uh, February, March, the influencers had like 20K followers, 25K followers. And then all of a sudden, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and they just all seemed to follow me because I do these spreadsheets and yeah. it was just, yeah, the perfect storm. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode four of Curated by Quantstam, where we have wandering conversations with Web3 founders. Tyler, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. This was a fun episode where we had the legend himself, Zeneca, to chat with us, all things NFTs. Yeah, it was so cool to talk about the NFT Google Sheets he used to create a year ago when we, I mean, we started, basically. And it just brings back nostalgia. It's only been a year. It's so crazy to think about that. But, but it was so cool to go down that journey with him and, you know, talk about, you know, kind of hear it from his perspective and how that whole thing started and, and where it is right now. Anything else that really stood out to you uh, from the episode? How his idea of Zen Academy started a year ago and he's developed it into this successful community where everyone is just uplifting each other and, and, and seeing success among themselves. It's awesome to hear that journey. Yeah. And also like talking about like, you know, CCO projects, his thoughts on that and like other builders. Uh, and there was a fun fact that what we, me, we, me and you both like, like laughed about. What, what was that? He operates on US time, even though he's in parts of Europe and recorded this at 3.30 a.m. wherever he was in the world. <laughs> and every so day he's crazy. up till 6.30 a.m. Yeah, so he's like working like from in the evenings and like late nights and, and we were recording this episode at 3.30 in the morning. Anyways, guys, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. So I want to start off with like, you know, talking to you about the infinite regret that the the Substack article that you posted, right? It really resonated with me because we chat about this a lot in the company where, you know, you have this one win and you were so happy, but then you have this one loss, you know, as a loss when you like made five ETH on making on flipping something and you're like, oh, shit, right. I lost five ETH. And, and you feel so bad, but it, it, it's such a crazy feeling, you know, it's such a crazy feeling of like just being grateful and like we're so lucky that we can make five ETH in like right. one transaction. And we don't really think about that. I would love for yeah. you to touch more upon uh, about that and like how how did that, what made you want to write that article and how you think about that? It's just interesting how much that article has resonated with almost everyone in the space. It just clearly shows to me how we all feel these feelings. And I think, uh, I mean, I was feeling regret. I was feeling infinite regret. Like I, I, I had, and despite like, I've had a wild year and just crazy success in so many different areas. And yet there were still times when I, I, I was like regretting not minting something or in some cases only minting two. It's like, well, I only have two Azuki. Why didn't I mint more? It's like, are you crazy? That is so <laughs> ridiculous to me, you know, make, and so I was like, I was feeling that I was like, well, yeah, let me just, let me just write and get it out. And, and, uh, I think if I remember correctly, I had written, um, something like much shorter and smaller in my discord and shared it and, and people really resonated with that. So this, the, the sub stack was like an expansion of that. Um, yeah. And I guess a lot of the ideas came from, uh, so before NFTs, I was a professional poker player and, and like there are a lot of similarities. And one of the similarities is that it's difficult for people outside the space to understand how you feel inside the space. And with poker, if you would play a tournament, a big tournament, and if you get seventh place out of 5,000 people, you know, the entry might be $100, you might win $15,000. I mean, I just, I don't know what the math works out to be, but you tell anyone that, they're like, congratulations, that's amazing. You tell a poker player that, and they're like, oh, condolences, I can't believe. Because like seventh is 15,000, first is 450,000 or, you know, whatever. And it's like, you don't focus on the amount you won. You focus on what you're this close to getting. 
And I think there are a lot of similarities with the NFT space where, again, if you flip something for two or three X, you tell, you tell your friends, you tell your family, you did that. Um, even though it goes on to like 20 X, they will be like, wow, you flipped a JPEG for a 300% return in five hours or 10 days. That's amazing. And you're like, you don't get it. You just, you don't, you just don't get it. And that that not getting it and everyone in the space getting it is sort of like uh, inspiration for the post, I think. I love that, man. Um, you know, I remember I had I mean, early on, I sold my ape for like, this is like back a while back and I sold it for like like 20 ETH. Like at that point, ETH mm. was like about 4,700 or something. It's like almost like 100 grand. And yeah. I was so, and I was telling all my friends about it, right? My dad about it. And and, and the guy bought a JPEG and made 100K in like a couple of yeah. months right and then when it became half a million i was just so sad i was like man why didn't yeah. i hope you know it was just it felt bad because i was like why didn't i, I had conviction i believed in the project mm. you know uh, but i was just like it's a top it can't be that much it's just crazy right but i also think that for me at least i think if 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 i would and just in general if all the money was in the world was given to me i wouldn't really respect it Right. Mm. It's like the earning part of it. It's like it's like making mistakes and learning and getting better. And like next time being smarter and not making those mistakes it makes you respect it. Because I really feel about this. Like once you've hit that financial freedom part, then you ask that question, what's next? Right. Yeah. And then, you know what I mean? So you got to like really you got to do it for the right reasons. Otherwise, otherwise, like winning a the lottery, they always I think there's a stat, right? People, most people yeah. win the lottery. They, they just lose it because they're just unhappy after that or something like that. Right. And it makes yeah. no sense. And like the level of happiness someone has, uh, like it, it's just, it doesn't change. Like you, you're basically about as happy as you were before and after winning the lottery, like regardless. And yeah, it's something I've been thinking about. And I think talking about a little bit lately is that if your goal is to make a hundred thousand dollars, you get there, you're not going to be happy. Then your new goal is to make 200,000 or 500,000. And then your goal is to make a million. You get to a million, you're not going to be happy. Your goal is going to be 2 million, 5 million. So the, the goal, you just, you're never going to be happy if your goal is financially based, I believe. Something I've been really figuring this out for myself lately is once I'm like at that level where like now a new project is coming because I've had initial amount of success and I'm kind of like happy in that sense, right? Now, like kind of bringing my friends in and w getting the squad to win. It's such mm. an amazing feeling. Winning things together, winning together, and uh, all losing together as well. It makes it a lot easier if you all buy into the same rug pull. You, you laugh about it <laughs> rather yeah. than just, yeah. Misery loves company and uh, joy loves company too. Just Yeah, I feel like yeah. those rug pulls that you do together become like a recurring joke. Yeah, exactly. Later, exactly. So. When I like think about like just hear your name or whatever, the first thing that comes to mind is like back in like, June, July, August, where it's like I sit down at night and all of a sudden you get like the Zeneca spreadsheets yeah. come to the top of your feed. And yeah. It would just break down the floor prices and then it'd be your commentary. And that almost became like a daily ritual yeah. to kind of digest everything. I missed that. Really I mean, awesome. honestly, I missed yeah. those days. It was. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just like when you're kind of just hustling and grinding, like it's so into it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it was crazy because. That's honestly, I, I literally believe that is what made everything blow up because yes. there was no, there was, That's there was I tell people like when we talk about you, <laughs> yeah, th th there was nothing else in the, like no one, there were none of these floor price tracking websites. OpenSea yeah. did not have the floor price. If you wanted to, you could manually go through and check the floor oh God, price. I forgot and, about it. It was like not even on OpenSea. It wasn't on OpenSea. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, this was it. And everyone would just share it and like retweet. And, and I just did it every single day for about six months. And it just, it seemed like as, cause the entire space was blowing up as well. When I got in in February, uh, February, March, the influencers had like 20 K followers, 25 K followers. And then all of a sudden, you know, June, July, August, September, October, it's just like, there's now hundreds of thousands of people and they just all seem to follow me cause I do these spreadsheets and yeah. it was just, yeah, the perfect storm. Well, I want to know, how do you think about these NFTs that are being created every day? Like what purpose do you think they will have in a few years? Yeah, I mean, I think like most people who've been in the space for a while will say 95% of projects are going to zero. Maybe 99%. Most of them are going to zero. It's just there's too many coming out every single day. But I'm probably a little more optimistic than, than most. I would say of the ones that we know about and that we hear about, so not the dozens that launch every day that no one hears about, they sell 20 NFTs, not including those, including the ones that like they trend on OpenSea or that people talk about. They come on, I, I think... 
more of those will survive than most people think. I think we'll get maybe 50%, which is, or maybe 30% will survive, so 70% fail. But it doesn't take that many people to make a community survive and thrive. It's like a few thousand people. Uh, and there's so many new people joining the space every single day that you know enough of them will eventually coalesce around a certain project because the art resonates with them or the team is really cool or the idea is cool or just the, the community is fun and, and people are vibing and whatever they, they enjoy. Um, and so, I mean, I guess to answer your question, I think most are still going to disappear and, and not be around in a few years, but the ones that are around are just going to be enormous behemoth brands, social media uh, universes really just with incredible... Um, value and depth and and all sorts of fun stuff uh yeah but and it's almost anyone's guess like sure it seems almost certain that yuga labs and board apes will still be around in five years but even then it's not a guarantee they've only been around for one year um almost every other project is like it used to be everyone was like yeah cool cats will for sure be around and i still think that they have stand a very good chance but the last few months has been like well there's and uh yeah who really really knows yeah yeah it'd be interesting to see when an nft winter happens right like what mm. what what survives and what kind of goes away it'd be very interesting to see because you are absolutely correct everyone's got their own guesses like 95 99 mm. uh, and, and whatnot but it'd be interesting to see like how people will act in that scenario right uh, yeah I'm actually, um, it sounds bad but i'm actually i don't know why i'm excited to see what happens i want to know i'm <laughs> like, fascinated you know? to see as well yeah it's yeah. gonna be because yeah. we haven't had one yeah I'm yep. glad that you gave like a different that you said it's like that you think it's going to be like 70%. Mm. I, I lately I feel like so many people like to say 99% is going to zero. And to me, that's just like a lazy answer. I'm sure you consult a lot of brands and you think about this. What does that brand look like apart from just a Discord channel in a, in a community? I think the ones that will survive are the ones that can use the intellectual property in a way to expand the brand like again like five thousand people ten thousand people is great it's not going to survive and be sustainable three years five years from now you need ways to get new people excited about your brand get new revenue coming into the project and having people win um and how do you do that it's i think uh like partnerships and collabs are great, but then why would a project want to partner with you just because you're an NFT project? Do you have to show them, hey, well, we have a strong community, we we have a big reach, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that that comes down to like storytelling, world building, and growing out the the intellectual property side of it, um, either from the individual holders using their NFTs or the brand itself going in a certain direction and building out uh, animated show, comics, books, lore, um, but good versions of those. Like it's, I think a lot of people will try and they'll create uh, an animation animated show or a book that's just not that compelling because it's difficult to make good content or a game that's just not that compelling. But the ones that are able to create something that is compelling, not just because it uses NFTs, but if you take the NFTs out of it and it's just a really good story, that is it's just it opens up infinite possibilities and and then you get people excited about the the brand for whatever reason, you know. Very interesting. Any anything that's been super like jumping out to you when you look at like somebody who's apart from obviously apes, somebody who has been doing a great job at this. I mean, Azuki obviously that they've done tremendously well. Um, I really like uh, Forgotten Runes Wizards Cult. They do a really good job of building out the lore and world. Uh, kind of all of the whole loot stuff, I think, is really fascinating. And there's a lot of builders there. Blitmap is another project that I think is doing really well. MFs is really interesting because it's fully community driven, but there's just tons of cool stuff happening. Um, Woody's is a, is a project where the team is really focused on story and a kid friendly lore and, and world building. Cool cat, cool cats. For, you know, for the wins and losses, like the game had a lot of rough. I think it's out now today, but um, yeah, I think they've done well about building this like family friendly brand. Um, honestly, there's a lot. There's just a lot of projects doing really good and cool things. Um, those are the ones that immediately come to mind, though. I just kind of wanted to hear your experience on, I guess, probably from last fall or maybe the end of the summer, kind of like how it was that you knew you wanted to start this community, that Zen Academy, 
and just how how everything worked out from having the open edition man to like kind of where you are now yeah so i had the idea i think june july last year is when i very first was like this would be a cool good thing to do the space needs a better way to onboard newcomers and there's no great educational resource and the idea was originally um for zen academy to be the one-stop shop so when any of us in the space had a friend or a relative who was like hey i want to get into nfts how do i do that you know for the most part it's like you hold their hand and walk them through and answer 50 questions and all that kind of stuff and we're still largely there but i was like hey what if we just set zen academy up and it has like a history of nfts and a timeline and courses how to set up metamask this that, and the other that would be great and then you know after a few weeks of thinking about it talking to people i was like this is a monumental undertaking like this is not something that i can do myself this is something that we need multiple content creators we need to constantly keep it updated because stuff is changing all the time and then i was talking to like uh big vcs and, and people wanted to like invest and help me build and partner and i just i didn't really want to deal with that i was still like one foot in the flipping side and one foot not sure what i want to do and i was like well, I could just sell all my NFT. I literally I was like, I sell my NFTs, I could buy a house and live on the beach and just like chill and read and, and do that. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if that I want to do that. And then, so I just kind of put a pin in Zen Academy. And then um, I was flipping and getting burnt out and flipping, like taking time off and then flipping. Burnout. And then I had uh, in September, October, so I was planning to go to America for NFT NYC, Ape Fest and the Art Blocks event in Marfa. And it was like five, four to five weeks all of October. And then because of COVID travel restrictions, I could not go. So I was like, well, now I've got all this time that I was basically planning to be away. That's freed up. I had no plans. Uh, maybe let me revisit Zen Academy. And I started having ideas of, you know, scaling it back. I was like, well, instead of launching everything at once, why don't we just start? And I, I, I launched a Discord, uh, I think around the July time, just to start slowly building up. And I was like, well, maybe we just build the discord out, build the community out from the ground up, start releasing a little bit of content and take it from there rather than top down. And we went the bottom up approach. Um, yeah, that was like the Genesis idea of it. And the discord had close to 10,000 people, I think just, you know, organically by me tweeting about it and sharing with people and getting people in. And then the original idea was for the discord never to be gated behind a token. I did not like the idea of that i was like education should be free everyone should have access to it etc but then we had an incident where a member got scammed because a bunch of people came in pretended to know each other posted a malicious link and then that person oh. ended up minting and, and losing a bit of money um fun fact though that that person is now a mod he's in my 333 club <laughs> he's he's really yeah uh, i really got to know him after that because I, I reached out and you know uh but happy ending um for that little thing but i was like yeah okay maybe there's merit to having a closed discord to protect the server to keep the quality high and all that kind of stuff um and we kind of struck a middle ground where we're like well we'll have free access for people to read it only because they can't scam people but they can read the content and get the... um so then that was the idea was yeah just to launch as a discord and then build from there and then in november we released the mint um both for Zen Academy and the 333 Club at the same time, which in, in retrospect, I'm not sure if I would do it the same. I might do one and then the other. Um, doing both at the same time was a lot, but I think it's, it's worked out fine enough. Um, and yeah, I was like, how do I want to structure the launch? You know, is a certain quantity, a certain price? And I really, really settled on the idea of doing an open edition at a low price, open for a couple of weeks, because that was, I wanted to, gas wars was still a big thing and gas was high and i wanted to give people the time and flexibility to take their time and not fomo not feel like they only have one day or one hour if they find it hopefully they have a bunch of time i, I wrote a lot about it as well the website is just full of text yeah. and uh which is a double-edged sword because I'm, I'm now i've five months later realized a lot of people don't like to read and they just won't read and people were telling me that at the time and i was like you know what? i'm writing is my thing i'm gonna do it and then great um Anyway, yeah, we sold about uh, 7,000, 6,800 um, of the Genesis uh, NFTs. And then we kept like 1,000 back for giveaways and promos and stuff, which is a lot. But, you know, it's been working out fine. And then, um, yeah, and then, then that was it. And then I was like, all right, we got the Discord. What now? <laughs> and, and, and just started building out the community and didn't do too much else in terms of craziness. Um, and then now this year, it's like 
what's next? Now we're really starting to think about structured courses. I had my first course come out this week and uh, building out the lore and the story and the world of Zen Academy. Where does it exist? What year does it exist in? Who are the characters? Um, and we will probably move towards a PFP drop, which I was really reluctant to do because I was like, we don't need another one in the space. We don't need another PFP project. But I'm coming around to the idea that uh, people like it and it helps create an emotional attachment and an identity with a project more than, say, a erc 1155 card or a letter or a token so yeah there's a lot happening um it's been fun so yeah. we got do we get wow. alpha announced on our podcast here the PFP, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah we, we've teased it uh, and i've definitely mentioned that we've thought about it and I, it's not 100 percent confirmed but i'd say like 95 percent we're moving in that direction and you know time frame wise i think we're like six months away i think i really want to take our time and do it slow and figure yeah. it out um, and again there's no rush yeah i i by the way you mentioned about the writing on your website i personally love that but when i read it and the reason to that was one uh i'm from a direct response marketing world so there's a marketer named frank kern and he does like a lot of like letters mm. and it reminded me of that every time he does that you'd read that letter and you kind of really get a sense of the person mm. um one thing that I loved about it where you were like, you were like, yeah, there is no roadmap. You yeah. you know, it might not go anywhere. It might just be a discord. I love that because you just did not, you did not set up expectations for mm. people. So it's more like, hey, if you want to get in, you know, obviously I'm in it for the right reasons. I'm going to work hard, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you can get in. But if not, don't get in. Like, you know, I think it's really cool because you didn't set any expectations up. Yeah. So I'm I, a, I really I'm, like that. I'm a big fan of under promise over deliver. I had so many people like friends and, and people that I, I knew really well who, who around that time or like in November, December afterwards were like, all right, so you said there's no roadmap. What are you actually planning? What is the roadmap? Like what, what's the, and I'm like, no, genuinely that I have no plans. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just, just start here and then I'm going to figure it out later on. And it wasn't until I think uh, end of January, really that uh, early Feb that I was like, all right, now, now let's, all right, let's, think and, and plan you know? yeah because i mean you're also learning as you're going right nobody mm -hmm. knows this space uh, when you people like we're gonna do this i'm gonna build an ip you're gonna like do this like yeah but like how like you don't even know it's possible right now yeah right? Uh, yeah it's so true but I, I really think that was really great way to do it in my in my opinion even the even the uh, the application process mm. uh, i think it's, it's beautiful i think that was very well done uh, yeah i, I would definitely want to commend you on that just for anyone that's unfamiliar that we had two price points for zen academy uh, two membership one was the genesis which was the open edition open for two weeks 0.033 eth which i think was around 140 150 dollars at a time which i thought was quite reasonable um and then the other is the 333 club which is this community that i've decided to create in addition or like within zen academy dedicated specifically towards founders builders people who want to who are more serious about the space and, and maybe have a project that they're working on and want more like um, hands-on advice, consulting from me, but networking with others. And I, I had an application process for that. So it wasn't an open mint. It's never been open for mint. You have to apply. Um, it was kind of like just a mint list thing. I was going to be like, all right, you apply and I'm going to, you know, we got like 1500 applicants to begin with. I was like, all right, well, this is wow. a ton. Um, let me, a lot of work. yeah, well, yeah, let me filter through. Uh, and just like weed out the clearly bots and the, you know, the, the flippers. And then, you know, we had like five to 800. I was like, oh, I'm just going to randomize. Like, I don't want to select individuals and then pick three through three and then put it out. And that's basically what we did. And we got like four people to mint because there was like six weeks between when I launched it and then when we opened wow. and the market had completely changed. The price of ETH had gone up wow. and I, I never went back and checked. So that was like... A small mistake, but I think it's it's a blessing in disguise because if we had sold out three through three on day one, I would have that would have been a huge mistake. So now it's been like this five month long minting process that we're now finally getting to a close, and the community's really built up slowly and organically. Um, and yeah, I still have about fifteen spots to give out or something, which is it's kind of crazy because the secondary market price is like twelve ETH or ten ETH now. Um, so it's like who do I pick? Immediately gets like six to ten ETH of value, um, but yeah. Basically, I'm picking people who are not wanting to flip and they're there for the right reasons. And yeah, I'm actually really curious about the new article you created. CCO season is coming mm. out soon. I want to know more about that. And also, I saw your post on bullish on Dom Hoff, which was a, a oh, yeah. huge post. I'm actually really curious on your thoughts on like uh, 
that whole CCO season plus the Dom Hoff part. Yeah. So, I mean, I've been bullish on CCO, CC0 for a very long time now, ever since I first heard about it pretty much because I think it just inherently synergizes with NFTs and crypto in a way that uh, IP licenses do not. Uh, for the most part, even with Bored Apes, you've got the NFT and then you have the intellectual property rights and they're separate. Like, sure, you've got, I own a Bored Ape and then Yuga Lab owns the IP rights and then they license it to me so I can use it for full commercial rights and do things. But then if Yuga Labs gets bought or sold, then the new company can decide what to do with it. And it's just so many complicated things. What happens if I create some IP with my character, but then I sell my ape? Does the new new owner of my ape then get royalties from it? How does that work? You know, where it's all messy and confusing, right. and it's just this fundamental disconnect between you don't actually have true ownership of everything of an NFT if there's restricted IP rights. So then CC zero is like, well, let's take all that away. No one has rights. Anyone can do whatever they want. Obviously, there's some drawback to the being the owner because if you build a brand, someone else can come along and use it and, and they can profit off it and without paying you anything. So there's there's pros and cons to CC0, but I think it's just super interesting specifically for NFTs and, and blockchain technology. And I think, um, yeah, we're seeing some cool stuff being built and developed and, and Dom Hoffman is doing a lot of that uh, as well as dozens of other really cool builders in the space. But uh, he was the one that first introduced me to CC0, the Blitmap project that he launched in, I want to say April last year. So, God, it's been a year. Um, yeah, so wild. Uh, they went CC0 like a couple months after launching. And, uh, you know, it's fully on chain and CC0. And then he's built, just been building, building. He's, he's just a true builder in the space. He's launched a bunch of really cool, interesting, innovative projects. He launched Loot. He launched Corruptions blit maps and then blit knots and then he's working on this thing called sup drive which is another crazy sounding project um which has raised 12 million dollars and and there's very little known about it um yeah i'm he is to my mind the best builder in the space that most people don't know about <laughs> which is crazy people just aren't aware and, and i still think blit map is the single hidden in plain sight gem in the entire space. But I've, I've been shouting that since it was open for minting and then it ran up to 30th floor and now it's back at five or seven or something. It's just, it's hard for me to ever think that it's overvalued because there's, there's such a small supply. It's this Genesis collection. It's this whole universe is being built by Dom who is this, yeah, I, I yeah, I, I, I love everything about flip maps and the community and, and what they're building and the storytelling and the lore and, yeah, I, I could go on and on, but you know. Okay, we gotta pause this episode. We gotta go mint. Uh, gotta go buy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not financial advice. <laughs> not financial advice. What was um? So what was your what was your first reaction when you heard that Yuga Labs was buying CryptoPunks? Um, Just like labs? whoa, like it it I did not expect it. Like there there were I think rumors that it was happening or something like that. And even then, I was like, yeah, it doesn't seem right. Uh, because it was it was Yuga. I think the rumors were that MeBits were getting bought or acquired, and like that was like yeah. okay, sure, maybe. But then it was like everything. It was like CryptoPunks. It was it was Yuga was just acquiring Lava Labs basically. It was just like wow, and it was just just. I expected uh, mergers and acquisitions to start happening in the NFT space, but I did not expect the number one project to acquire the number two or the number two to acquire the number one, whatever way you want to look at it. It's like all right, now it's just now it's just crazy and yeah um i thought it was i mean a good thing for punks uh and mebits just because lava labs had not really been great uh stewards of of the project for the last year um which is funny because when they did nothing and their hands off it was great but it's when they started doing stuff that <laughs> it started causing issues um but i guess the market is sort of not necessarily agreeing with it. I think punk prices are down. Mebits are back at what they were before the acquisition. Um, and apes keep going up. Uh, I guess it'd be interesting to see what Yuga is planning to do, if anything. Yep. I know they've said that they plan to be fairly hands off and, and just at least to begin with, they're just the only thing they're doing is really intending to release the full commercial rights to punk holders. Um, 
but you got to imagine they have bigger plans because they wouldn't have spent how much money they spent on yeah. it just to yeah. out of the goodness of their hearts and, and goodwill you know yeah you know what's crazy we were talking about the infinite regret in the start uh when the space started i remember having you know having an ape and i was like my goal is to to just like if i could change every, give away everything that i have it was like starting out like you know my initial like last year may or something and i was like if i could just my goal is to hold one pump yep. because it's going to be the provenance you know and, and and then when the whole shift happened i look back at it i'm like fuck now my goal is to sell everything and hold an ape. yeah <laughs> so it's interesting how it all it all changed but uh but you know it's such an so interesting crazy. So crazy to think about, and a company worth sixteen billion dollars in a matter of a year. Yeah, like that. Just you know, in the startup world, I just like I just so it's so crazy. ridiculous. I, um, yeah, yeah. I, I I basically thought a lot of the same things. Like my goal for a very long time was to get to a punk and to flip to a punk, and I I I, I think I even went on record saying like I tweeted as like people like Are apes ever going to flip punks. I was like, no, I, I I love the apes. I don't think that's going to happen. If that happens, I'm probably selling my ape. I'm selling my ape. I'm getting a punk, and it happened, and I didn't do it. <laughs> I was just like, and I have three apes, and and I was like, oh, I could sell one and get a punk, and it's just like, it just never felt right, and. I guess yeah. narratives shift and change and I'm still, I'm sure yeah. punks will do fine and great long-term. Yep. Uh, they're just, they're, yep. they're historic and monumental. Uh, but yeah, I, lately I've been calling them the stable coin of NFTs because the, they've just been hovering between that 60 to 70 ETH range <laughs> a little bit above every yeah. now and then, but they're just, yeah. Yeah. Talking about uh, old projects or historic projects, I saw you were very excited about ghost comic today. Mm. Why? Why was that? I... Yeah, I mean, I lo- I love just everything that they put out and the Ghosts project, and I never, never got in. I never could quite justify buying into it. Um, and then yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of comics, and I saw that it was dropping. Um, and I just wanted to have ex- a exposure to that universe from an investment perspective. I wanted to collect it from a collector's perspective because I love the art and I love just the the story behind how they started selling for like pennies and then just adding utility and building this really organic community. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. I haven't, I bought it this morning. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. I'm really excited to, to read the comic because just the cover looks amazing to me. Just the colors are so vibrant. And, um, I remember... I, and I only found out that it was dropping like three days ago. Like it, it was mm-hmm. coming up and it was just like another wake up call. It's like, there was so much happening in this space. Like how did, like how, how did I not know? And then, um, yeah, I think it was like mint list only plus owners got to claim one for free or something like that. And so when I saw them on the second day, I was like, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I, I got to get, I got to get some. Yeah. I have been really thinking about this with the, you know, that, if you look at the Google search trends, you know, the NFT kind of like, it's been kind of on the low and, and we, we, it's the, the, the expansion is a little slow with, you know, it takes time to build cool stuff and it takes time for, to evolve. And, but there is hype with like, you know, coin, Coinbase coming out of the exchange and, and uh, you know, and Facebook or Instagram might launch something soon or whatever. How do you think about what's the current state of the NFT world right now? Because I, I am, I think that we are due a, a like a, you know, some kind mm-hmm. of like a winter and then building back up. Um, how do you think about that? Do you think that will happen, or do you think we're, is, is, it's already kind of happened because we, you know, we kind of go in smaller. It's not like a really crazy mm-hmm. ICO kind of drop. It'll be like a smaller drop. How do you think that? How do you think about that? Yeah, I think um, so. The NFT market at least over the last year has had these bull and bear cycles, which are really condensed. And like, we've been through a bunch of bull markets and bear markets or what people call bull markets and bear markets already, but it's sort of all been a bull market in one sense. Like this last year, we haven't really had a catastrophic drop. Um, at least not sector wide. We've had individual projects that obviously crashed a lot. Um, I think that we are, continuing to just march towards mainstream adoption at a a pace that is not going to slow down. I think this time last year, a lot of people thought maybe NFTs were a fad. Maybe it was going to like drop off and then no one else would really care about it for a while. But I think just looking at this, the 
adoption that's happening and the number of people from just so many diverse backgrounds who are getting in. Um, that plus knowing the companies and the organizations and the people that, and the platforms that are building really cool big things for NFTs and the funds that are deploying huge amounts of money. To me, it seems like we've reached the tipping point. Mainstream adoption is coming and that's just, it's every day we're going to get more people in and it's just going to keep accelerating. Um, and things like Coinbase Marketplace is going to help. Uh, Facebook slash Meta, Instagram adopting NFTs is going to help. Um, that's just inevitable. That said, um, I do think we are at some point due for an NFT winter, a big crash, either a big crash or just a really prolonged, slow bleed, sideways momentum type thing. Um, there's two things I think that could happen that would lead to at least the big crash. One is the SEC comes along and is like, hey, 90% of these NFT projects are securities, blah, 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 blah. Bam, regulation spaces in panic and, and just no good hmm. i think the, the sec coming is a matter of uh when not if um they will come and then it's like to what extent are they going to regulate is it going to be every project is going to be the ones that issued tokens is it like where are they going to draw the line and that's like the gray area um that a lot of lawyers are debating about still um but they they're, they're definitely coming there's just there's no two ways about that mm -hmm. Who knows when? Um, the other thing is, I think, and I've said this a bunch of times, we're seeing protocols come online that allow everyday users to collateralize their NFTs and like take liquidity out against their NFTs. Uh, that hasn't really, really been possible up until now. There's been services like NFT Fire where you can take peer-to-peer -peer loans and it's a bit clunky. You pay gas to borrow and then to repay. You got to find someone. It's usually 20, 50, 100% interest rates and not many people use it there are protocols coming online that are like automatic market makers where anyone can go in and to begin with with blue chip nfts say i've got a punk i've got an ape i want to take 30 percent of the value of it of the floor value of it uh in eth directly and at four percent five percent and that's going to trickle down to more collections it'll be you know they'll figure out ways to evaluate them and then people who have all these nfts will be able to take say hey this is great like I have these NFTs. I don't want to sell them, but I want to buy these other NFTs. Oh, I want to, I want to have ETH. I'm, everyone's always juggling liquidity in this space. It's like, what do I sell so I can mint the new thing or buy the new thing? Um, and those are going to really, it's going to unlock a lot of money. And, and some people, the responsible people, will take the, you know, pay the four or 5% and, and unlock the liquidity, go to DeFi, get 10, 20% and have their money work for them. And that's probably a great use case for it. Um, the, I don't want to say less smart, but the riskier people, the more aggressive people will be like, I'm going to take that. I'm going to buy more NFTs. Like I'm going to leverage and, and, you know, double down. I think I'm so bullish on NFTs. I'm going to take a 40 ETH loan against my ape and go buy a mutant. I'm going to take 40 ETH loan against my ape and go buy, you know, an Azuki or 10 cyber brokers or whatever. And then when, and, and that's going to make prices go up, like it's going to shoot things up. But then eventually when things turn, because people leverage things start crashing. It's just going to crash so much harder and worse. People are going to panic and start undercutting. And they're like, oh crap, I got to sell my mutant or my cyber brokers, or I'm going to lose my ape. I can't pay back 40 ETH. How am I going to get, okay. Well, they... And then they're like, well, all right, if I can't do that, maybe I'll just sell my ape and then at least pay or sell something else. It's just, it's going to be bad. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen. I, I don't know if these protocols are going to come out and be like that. That's my suspicion, though. And if, if, if that starts happening and I see that happening, uh, that'll probably be when I for, like start to sell a lot of NFTs, which I've basically never done. Yeah. Hmm. Do, do you think that these two things that you mentioned, if the, both those things don't happen for, let's say, a couple of years, do you think without these things like, you know, creating FUD in the market, do you think we'll, we won't have a crash if, if that doesn't happen? Or unless like something big that, like that doesn't happen? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it, unless we get a black swan event or almost a black swan event like those things, um, yeah, I think it's pretty much still up only as as a whole. Like, again, a lot of projects are going to launch and a lot of projects are going to go to zero, but the ones that don't, yep. well, they'll just keep going up. Like people, 
Yeah. It's like there's a finite supply and there's more people entering the space, more money entering the space. Um, these are luxury goods and, and they have certain now utility associated with them uh, that people want. And yeah, it's, I'm, I'm like, I'm very bullish on NFTs. I think it's largely up only for a long time, but still crazy high risk because individual projects could crash. Yeah. And again, SEC and, you know, leverage trading happening yep. can just cause it all to come tumbling down but then you zoom out and look 10 years from now projects that are around then that are here now if board apes around in 10 years if cool cats if whatever cyber brokers or blip maps around in 10 years they're going to be doing amazing definitely makes sense uh my last question for you is who are some of the builders people projects, whoever you want to call it, could be, could be anyone, it could be podcasters, all I can think of, like, could be like, you know, uh, yeah, like builders who are building something like in different, completely different tooling, right? Who do you, maybe like three or five people that you really are very bullish on? Dom Hoffman, obviously. Um, I, yep. I really love Loopify. I think he's a really great builder in the space and just his tweets and Twitter threads are sensible. Um, when he's not shit posting, <laughs> which is just for fun. But whenever, when, yeah, when, when he's serious, he posts really sensible, smart things. Uh, Punk6529 is just genius. But yeah, I can't wait. To, I don't know who it is, but I can't wait till we find out who it is because I think he's hinted that he's going to reveal his identity at some point. It's a story for another day, he said. Wow. Um, hopefully. Um, that's three. I really like... Uh, Brendan Mulligan from Premium. I spoke to him, I think last night, actually, the day before for my podcast and just hearing just, he's just such a good builder, like just how quickly he's able to innovate. Like I've been using Premium for Zen Academy in three, three for a few months. And I remember like I started using it and then like every three or four days I'd log in and they're just new features. They'd just be like an yep. additional thing. I was like, oh, this is, this is really good, useful stuff. Um, I miss not to say Kevin Rose with proof and Moonbirds that everyone's talking about this week. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Yeah, yeah. what is your this is gonna be posted like you know, probably like two weeks. So, like, what do you think is like gonna be your kind of prediction for Moonbirds coming out of the gate? I think, uh, there'll be a lot of sales in the five to eight ETH range, six to eight, is yeah, that's what like everyone's saying. Um, yeah. In two weeks, so I guess when this is coming out, I think it'll be at like 12, 12 to 13. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Perfect. Love it. Like that it. was actually exactly my prediction. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 I'm yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was like, I was like, yeah, if it, if it, because, you know, when something happens, all of a sudden people start, you know, start selling mm. right away. I was like, I was like, if I could get anything for three and a half, four, yep. I'm closing my eyes and I'm yep. buying, I to hit some, because I, I think it might be a 30 minute or an hour window where people like who just trying to flip quick. Mm. I'm like, that's the only time after that. I feel like it's going to five to eight. And then in a couple yeah. of weeks or a month, it goes to 13. Uh, just because of that whole, I think it's comparable projects, right? Like doodles are all, they are that range. Mm. So it makes sense. He's like, he's a known, known his, uh, how would, by the way, how do you like the, you were in, I, I saw that you uh, signed up for the proof, uh, proof pass. How do you like the community? It's, and it's how a wonderful you... community. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, that's one of my biggest regrets is not getting in at Mint and not buying in earlier because I love Kevin. I listen to the podcast. It's like I used to listen to Modern Finance and then he was launching Proof and I listened to it since day one. Somehow I missed. I just, I, just, I, I have no idea how I didn't get in earlier. But So I ended up buying it 55 ETH, which is by far the most expensive. Wait, it's not actually the most expensive NFT. I bought, I bought a Punk. See. But um, yeah, oh, okay. but so funnily, I bought the Proof Pass and I was like, this is crazy. I should sell some NFT. So I listed my punk. My punk is listed for sale because again, punk is stable coin of the NFT space and the proof pass seems to be where it's at. And uh, yeah, the community is just great. It's it's full of a diverse uh, group of people from just a lot of people's first NFT is the proof pass and they come from like web two success and entrepreneurship yeah. and, and knowledge and uh, just this is the, the, what they know of NFTs. And then you have some of the, yeah. So it, it's really interesting how Kevin's audience reached. It just crossed the chasm and it didn't really attract the NFT people as much as it did the non NFT people who are now becoming NFT people um, and learning from each other. And um, 
Yeah. I mean, I think it's a testament to the community. There's like 16 lists for sale out of a thousand on secondary. Um, yeah. Which is just wild. You, you want to hear my infinite regret? I was like, I'm going to sell my proof and then go heavy on Moonbirds mm. because the upside on Moonbirds, and I don't have enough liquidity. So I'm like, I, I, sell, I sell my proof. So I sold it for like 53, right before, I think a day before mm. you bought. So I saw you bought it. And I'm like, fuck. Uh, uh, so I, I'm like, I'm going to like sell it, take X amount of ETH out and just go heavy mm. on Moonbirds because I knew the upside on that would yeah. be so much that I didn't see proof hitting, right? And then as soon as I did that and then they changed it to a raffle and I'm like, fuck, I got, I yeah. got in the price I'd coin. Yeah. And I was like, no. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but glad we have another one. So not bad. Or at least a part of the community, which is a great yeah. thing. But, but I was just very sad about it. Infinite regret, man. <laughs> I yeah. regret. I'm still pretty grateful. No, I'm happy. No, it's, it's, yeah. I'm just joking. But thank you so much for coming on the show, man. This was, this was beautiful. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun.